It's not a door. It's not a door. Nope. Where goes excited but about walls? I love seeing the size of this. It's that feels bigger than it was in my imagination. Cool. Margo's not the only one excited. Building walls is super fun, and it's the magic of where your building goes from being just a bunch of boards to the shape of what you're finally gonna see. In these next series of videos, we're actually gonna start with the floor of this building, which is basically just a wall built on the horizontal. This will be a multiple part series to try and introduce you into terminology and different ways of building the walls and then standing, raising them, and connecting them. Then the pieces that we had to do specific for this building are we needed something to set it on. So we went ahead and did concrete blocks um, on our supporting major load-bearing wall. What the heck is a load-bearing wall? Well, for simple purposes of a load-bearing wall, we're going to use this greenhouse example. So if I'm standing on the roof, or I'm a really big snow load, I'm exerting downward pressure on this big flat roof surface, which in this case you can even see is bowing this beam that is a little insufficient for the load without any support underneath it. So it's taking that downward pressure and transferring it into empty air. So this is a load bearing wall. In the back where I have a fully built wall, a normally classic built wall, you can see that I'm transferring pressure from the roof onto the top plate, down through the wall studs and directly to the ground. On the front in the corners, you can see those big old corner posts are transferring the load of the corners quite nicely on that load bearing wall. My four sided structure, my north and my south wall, my north wall being the short one and my south wall being the big face for a greenhouse, are my load bearing walls. Whereas my east wall and my west wall are gable walls. They're supporting very, very little, just a little bit of the lookouts and a little bit of the roof to the either side. So those walls aren't as critical for bearing the load of my roof or if I had a second story, my second story floor, but they are gonna be very critical for shear walls, which we'll look at later major load-bearing wall, which in this case is our north wall and our south wall, and we have three blocks, um, which are also our long walls. We have blocks at every 10 feet. We chose to pour these blocks in place, and we chose to send them down to rock. We could have put this movable building on a variety of different foundations. We could have dug a crawl space. We could have done sweaters. This is what we chose. Um, and so now we were ready to build our floor which Margo and I did with two by sixes because we want the insulation space. Um, if we weren't insulating this, we might've chosen to put them on two by fours because they're cheaper and better use of wood, but we're insulating this floor space. We're actually doing something super funky here because we're, gonna, we're building the floor upside down and then we're gonna flip it so that we can see, put insulation in this floor, seal it, Tell those mice they are not welcome in our building and they just can't eat all our insulation, um, which is why we're building it upside down. So the things that we needed to do to build it upside down are we chose, we had the perimeter of our building, which you'll see in the stop motion, we kept checking our diagonals to make sure we were keeping this as square as possible when we're building it. And we'll check our diagonals again before we put the sheathing on to make sure our building is still square because once we put the bottom of our floor on, our building will no longer shift. That should, our building should be square and stay square. Let's revisit the concept of squareness. So on this greenhouse wall, we have two studs that are going to be the same length and we have two wall plates that are going to be the same length. But what happens if those tilt or shift? All of a sudden, you have the same length wall studs that you had before. We have no board shorteners or board stretchers magically, although we'd love them. But your diagonals, now you've got one short diagonal and one long diagonal. So now your wall is out of square. So you're going to have to keep checking that and keep beating on one end of your wall or tapping it over until both of your diagonals are equal. So on our floor, we've got 10 feet wide by 20 feet long. We've checked this a lot before now because the more lumber we add, the harder this is to fix. And with our construction calculator, we know at a 90 degree angle, if we're square, we should have 22 feet, four inches and five sixteenths. So we're gonna check that diagonal and we're gonna be sure we're measuring on the same side of the tape every time we check diagonals. So that's your A squared plus B squared equals C squared equation where 20 feet is your A squared, 10 feet is your B squared and C squared is your hypotenuse.
You can also use the 3-4-5 method for this, where you measure three feet out on one side, four feet out on the other side, and check to make sure your diagonal is five feet out. That proves that you have a 90 degree corner inner square. So the longer the measurement, the better off you'll be. So if you multiply this by two, you can take six feet, eight feet, 10 feet, or by three, nine feet, 12 feet, 15, or four, 12 feet, 16 feet, and 20 feet, and so on and so forth. The larger the diagonal you check, the more accurate you'll be. Um, we also have our floor joists. And we chose to put them on 24 inch centers because we bought uh, insulation that's meant for a 22 and a half inch cavity. What do I mean when I say on center? Well, in the case of this wall that I'm building on the ground, we're going from the center of one wall stud to the center of the other wall stud. And that space is the distance that we're measuring. In the case of this greenhouse, and in the case of the floor, we were doing 24 inch centers which is pretty common for advanced framing where you're trying to maximize your use of lumber. Also common is 16 inch centers and you'll see that a lot in our walls. In addition, let's look at a couple more wall elements here while we have this wall on the floor. Our lumber is an inch and a half wide, which means we should have three quarters of an inch on either side of this to attach our sheathing or our drywall to. So that's three quarters of an inch to the center of our wall stud. Let's introduce some other terminology here. We have a bottom plate, that's the two by six that our walls are attaching to at the bottom. And then conversely, we'll also have a top plate. And in most cases on walls we'll build, we'll actually be building double top plates to attach multiple walls together. In addition on this, we're gonna have a treated uh, mud sill or a treated board that our plate is attaching to because in, remember if we're attaching to concrete we have a treated board we're never untreated onto concrete and then we're screwing our wall studs in either through the top and the bottom or we're going to end up toe screwing them in from either side screwing through the top and the bottom is the easiest toe screwing means we can move our boards whenever we want to if we discover we want to change something pretty much everything in lumber either works on 16 inch centers or on 24 inch centers. We wanted more insulation per wood ratio. We felt like our building was strong enough, so we made that decision. We did double up our outside rails because this is a 20 foot length. And so over here, we have two 10 footers that are broken. You can buy 20 foot two by fours, but they're very expensive and they're often crooked. So we chose to go with two 10s but that meant we supported this break in our tens by putting a full length 10 on the outside and then two fives. And now this whole reel is super stiff because if we ever moved this building, which we're not planning on, but we're building it like we might, we would want that to be super stiff. We also added blocking. This blocking doesn't matter so much with what we're doing on the bottom of the floor. It will matter a lot with what we're doing on the top of the floor when we flip this whole thing over. Um, Things to remember that I forgot and is when we were building this, we had a single plate and then eventually we're having a double plate. So I put my blocking um, actually an inch and a half short, which is not a problem structurally. It just means I have to rip a small piece of OSB for that side. The more details you remind yourself of or go through, the less of these small mistakes you'll make that you have to undo or accommodate. But that's also why we put everything together with screws. If it was essential for the structure that this blocking had to be exactly um, 48 inches from the outside, if I'm not just filling it with a small piece of OSB, um, I would have unscrewed all of these and moved them <coughs> at the point at which I realized that I put the blocking in the wrong spot. Or, sorry, Margo did most of the blocking. Margo and I, well, I told her where to put the blocking, so it's my fault, but she actually installed it. When you're installing blocking, what's lovely is you get to screw through the end of these, but then coming in the sides, you have to toe screw through the next one um, once you get the first piece of blocking in. And we'll show toe screwing when we build walls and things, but basically you're coming in at an angle, top and bottom and screwing in. It's still plenty strong. It just takes a little bit more practice than just sending screws straight in the end. Yeah, so that's our floor. Uh, other considerations we had, we have a toilet that's actually over here, but because we're flipping this floor, you have to remember to build things in reverse. When you're installing drywall and things, this will come into play too, but orienting your headspace to where you're building is to 
really hard, so leave yourself notes. We have also marked all of our studs on the outside of our farthest rim joist so that we have reference points when we go and we put down our sheathing and hide all of this, and then we go to screw it into everything, we can snap string lines from these marks. So put these marks down before you hide them, or as I usually do, realize you haven't put your marks after the first sheet, and then spend the time to put your marks in after you put the first sheet on and work that way. Um, we, ha we have a wood stove on the far side, so we added a little extra blocking over there, um, just because it's a very heavy piece of uh, iron, cast iron that's sitting on there, so went ahead and added that. Other than that, we are essentially ready to start adding our sheathing and start hiding all of this from the bottom. A quick note on the corners of our floor. Anytime you can stagger seam joints like we have here, both boards don't end at the same spot and butt into the board, they stagger, you will make a stronger corner. Just remember to send your screws in at different heights so you don't try and screw into the same space. So now we installed the zip sheathing for the bottom of our floor. And for the edges, we actually glued down all our edges to keep the critters out from coming out of the edges. And then for the screwing schedule, because these are four by 10 foot sheets of zip sheathing, we have screws on the edges at every six inches and screws on the center floor joist at every 12 inches or every foot. And after we get all of the sheathing down, we've double checked and made sure everything's square before we put our first piece of sheathing on because we can't change it once the sheathing's on. Then we started taping all the seams, which air sealed and moisture sealed all our seams from the underside. And then we went and we knew we were flipping over this floor and we have a toilet going in, so we have a septic line coming down. So we needed to locate that and make sure we got our height right and then cut out the hole for that septic, as well as adding the skids for the bottom of our structure which remember are gonna be treated boards because they're sitting on concrete. Tool tip, we need a round hole for the septic line in the bottom of our floor, but so far we've only cut square holes. So how do we cut a round hole with our tools? Well, one of the ways you can do this is by using a drill and a drill bit and then a handsaw. In our case, they make little great, you know, short punch handsaws. We own a jigsaw, so I'm gonna go ahead and show using a jigsaw because it's fast and efficient. Um, you also might have a friend that you can rent this from. So step one is to take a, your drill and a drill bit that's bigger than your blade or to drill multiple times with a drill bit to make a hole that's big enough for your blade. Send that in your floor. and then test to make sure your blade fits in. Also, your blade depth might be important if you have anything underneath you don't wanna cut, so just remember that for cutting. Uh, if you're using a jigsaw, it has a little guide, a little notch, a little arrow that says where you're going, so you're gonna follow that. Make sure to put on your ears, because jigsaws are loud. double check to make sure everything fits. And then for our purposes, we'll end up foaming and siliconing this in place after we flip the floor. This floor. So we put zip sheathing on the bottom of the floor because it's got this super dense, you're not gonna be able to hear that over the wind. Wind, stop! 